The 1964 National Championship comes down to one race. Two drivers, mathematically eligible, only separated by three points, heading in to the Trenton 300. Foyt leads the championship by three points over me. Pretty much all AJ has to do is finish ahead of me at the Trenton 300 and he has the championship. Doesn't even matter if, I, if he scores points or if I don't score points or if any of us score points, of course, that means Foyt will take the championship. But if I finish ahead of him, Foyt will need to essentially be one position behind me uh, to claim the championship. Now, depending on some positions, uh, I, he will need to be two, ahead, or two behind me or only uh, one behind me. Uh, but it's going to be a very uh, tightly fought championship coming down to the wire. And Trenton is not one of my best tracks. I'll need to break the Trenton curse that has hung over me this entire career mode to take the championship win. This is the final race of 1964 on Indy 500 month. It's kind of appropriate that the last race of the 1964 season and indeed the championship comes down between a driver using a rear engine car versus a driver using a front engine car. Speak of the devil, AJ Foyt goes to the pole position at 136.9 miles per hour and is knocked off the pole position by the winner at Milwaukee. Don Branson in the Watson Ford uh, rear engine race car. Bobby Marshman in a Lotus goes to third. Bud Tinglestad, one of the faster uh, drivers in the Roadsters, is fourth. Bob Harkey should be near the back, and indeed he is, though he's not nearly as slow as Mike Hathaway. And Lloyd Ruby out next, and he actually goes to second in a Roadster. Another one of the Roadster drivers, Norm Hall, seventh. Not sure what uh, kind of a car he drives. I honestly can't remember. And Jimmy Clark in the Lotus Ford goes to second at 137.5 miles per hour. Jim Herdeby is another Roadster driver going fifth. Big entry list here, by the way, at Trenton for a 300 miler. That's good because we're going to at least have some traffic if uh, the leaders start to pull away. Cheeseburg to fourth in a Roadster. Bob Wente, usually one of the slower drivers in this season, and indeed clap. he lives up to that reputation at a 129 miles per hour. Parnelli Jones to the pole in a roadster, almost 138 miles per hour. Roger Ward in another Watson rear engine Ford. And then Johnny Boyd at uh, 12th position, 131.6 miles an hour. Ronnie Duman in another roadster, 130.5. Mathauser, Rotman, and McElreath, and Grimm, all Roadsters. So I'm actually the last rear engine car to actually go out to qualify in my Halibrand. Rutman goes to 10th overall. Let's see if I can take away the pole from the Roadsters and Parnelli Jones, but the man I'm really shooting for is A.J. Foyt, who right now is sat in 7th place at a 136.9. Tells you how competitive and how fast this field is. Let's see where I stack up. All right, ready to qualify at Trenton Speedway. The Halibrand chassis with an Offenhauser engine. Ready to see what we got here at this very unique kidney bean shaped oval with a right handed turn in it, which we are coming up to right now. And we'll head down the back straightaway into turn number three, high banked corner here, which is actually um, what the turn one at the Pocono Raceway is based on, if you didn't know that already. Pretty interesting fact there as I drive off of the corner down the main straightaway about to take the warm-up lap here this is usually a pretty good indication of what I'll be able to run sometimes I run faster in the warm-up than I do in qualifying getting the car down into the corner oh it's much more stable than the Novi I had driven here in the Trenton 150 but you can see I got a little bit loose asked a little bit too much out of it car felt a little back end uh, happy through there as you'd kind of expect with a rear engine car lifting off into turn three definitely able to keep the speed up Ooh, that was a bit of a correction as well as the car seems a bit loose for sure we'll see what the lap speed is uh, across the line just about now 141 wow that's easily on the pole position so I've got to put it together for another lap but that is a good speed at this one and a half mile oval. Can I inc 
improve on that. It looks like right now I'm running a much better, much smoother lap, at least right now. We'll see how that all comes together as they come through three and four at Trenton Speedway, right down, touching the grass just a little bit. Out of the corner, very stable. Car feels very stable. I think this is gonna be a pretty good lap. Let's see. Oh yeah, 37, 145 miles an hour. That is fast. That is very, very fast for this track. I'm trying not to lose it. But I couldn't quite hold on to it that time. This lap's probably going to be worse. But it is the only, uh, it's only one lap qualifying. You get two laps, but it's the best lap that counts. And right now, the best lap is well above the pole position right now. As I come off of the final corner looking behind me, and I'm going to cross the line here at probably, well, 144.8. Not too bad. So that's a good sign heading in to the Trenton race. I am the pole sitter by quite a big margin. Eight miles per hour over Parnelli Jones. I can't even believe it's that much. How is it that much? Unbelievable speed from me. Uh, that I found here at Trenton, uh, Parnelli just completely off the pace, 137 miles an hour for the top guys, uh, almost 138 for Parnelli, but then again, I'm almost at 145 and a half, so wow, that's a good sign that maybe the Trenton curse may be broken, only 22 cars here versus the 26 that showed up at Milwaukee, so hopefully a little bit less excitement in this race, but you never know what may happen because it's a much faster track. So here we go. Trenton Speedway for the Trenton 300. Welcome to Trenton International Speedway. This 1.5 mile oval track is very fast and a popular stop for all the drivers and teams. Well, this is one of those races where you ask yourself what the heck is going to happen. Carnelli Jones and Don Branson starting behind me. AJ Foytmeyer deep in the field and we're underway here at Trenton for the Trenton 300. I'm going to be very cautious on the start. Parnelli looked to the outside, couldn't quite get it done. Jim Clark has moved up into fourth position. He won here in the Trenton 150 in the first race of the year. So despite the fact that he had a crash at Milwaukee, which took him out of the championship hopes uh, and even skipped the Langhorn round, he is running up near the front. But again, the speed of this Halibrand chassis car on the oval tracks is unreal. Already got a one second advantage over Parnelli after just one lap. Cheeseburg, Ruby round out the top five. AJ Foyt all the way back in eighth position, the final car in the points paying positions. So that's pretty crazy. Hard to believe that AJ's that far behind the times and potentially could not score any points at all but again as we saw in Milwaukee it's not a guarantee that you'll win the race just because you dominate it that was the same deal in Indianapolis though it wasn't a mistake on my part it was simply bad strategy kind of necessitated by the fact that the rear engine cars are a little bit less fuel efficient than the roadsters and that's how it goes so Hathaway is going to be the first car I lap Seems as though the, the uh, Novi's that were so slow at Milwaukee have decided to not show up here. I guess uh, after the, the absolute uh, the war, I guess you could say that was Milwaukee with the uh, amount of carnage at that race, everybody uh, maybe took a look at their budgets and said, hey, you know what, I actually want to race in 1965. Ooh, boys, I almost lost it in turns one and two, so... Got to be careful, but yeah, seems like everybody had a rethink after that crash-filled race. And I've already got six seconds on Parnelli coming to complete lap four. Don Branson has really turned it on at the end of this season. The win at Milwaukee certainly elevated him quite a bit. But, you know, he's backing it up here at Trenton at the moment, running right near the front. As I lift off the gas car, backfires. Look at how just stable it is. It's so stable through the corners. I'm not even going to start downshifting. I'm just going to 
really baby the car here early on. Don't need to go too hard. Again, it's a 50 lap race. And because this is a one and a half mile oval versus the one mile oval at Milwaukee, this should take a little bit longer than at, uh, at Milwaukee. Of course, it's probably not gonna take quite as long as Indianapolis, though I could be surprised. You never know. Again, very unique circuit here, Trenton. Of course, New Jersey doesn't like their race cars too much, so not, not a real surprise that it doesn't exist anymore. They couldn't even keep the English Town uh, dragway open. So it's kind of a shame, despite the fact that, like, again, in real life, New Jersey has a lot of uh, racing uh, heritage, including, at least at the time of recording, the current NASCAR champion, uh, Martin Truex Jr., hails from New Jersey. So, you know, uh, I guess the, um, the local governments and whatnot don't like racing. But uh, there's a lot of racing heritage here. So lift off going into turn one, just very, taking it very easy early on here. Because that can happen where the car will decide to step out on me. So I need to let off the gas a little bit more, I think. Try not to drive the car through the corner. And I think I may be downshifting as well on this next lap. Because I don't like how that back end's coming around. That worries me a little bit. So I've already got 12 and a half seconds on Parnelli Jones. I, hey, I may not even need to upgrade this car for next year. It may be competitive for a whole nother year with just how fast it is. Now, I may upgrade the engine uh, come Indianapolis because you just don't know exactly how competitive everybody's going to be there, and especially considering how I lost the 64 race by having to make a pit stop when everybody else did. I think I may be investing in a 65 Offy engine, even if I stick with the Halibrand chassis, uh, just to try to, you know, make sure I maintain the advantage that I had so that I can maybe put together a better winning strategy for 65. Ooh, boy, oh boy. The car is very loose through turn number one here at Trenton. And we're already seeing lap cars. That should be the uh, the last place qualifier as A.J. Foyt moves from eighth to seventh. So give him some more championship points, but he's not in a position yet to really worry me. Were he to get to second, there's a point swing of two there. So if A.J. gets to second, I've lost the championship by one point. But if AJ finishes anywhere but second and I win it, I also take my second championship. We'll just have to wait and see. As we've got a couple roadsters up here. Be interesting to see how many roadsters actually survived in 1965 and then eventually to 66 and 67. Of course, we know how it goes in the real life as I go underneath Mike Hathaway here. And actually he's in one of those, uh, one of those Novi's, the Curtis Novi's. And it's kind of interesting that, uh, I think that car has changed drivers. I don't think Hathaway has been driving that car all year. So interesting to kind of see uh, what I assume is a bunch of pay drivers coming in and taking that uh, and doing some ride swapping throughout the season as Norm Hall very slow in his roadster probably running a pace, if you can believe it, fast enough to be very, very, very competitive in uh, 1961 or 1962, but here in 1964, the tide has it turned, and at the moment, it's really looking like the rear engine cars are going to be what you need, as Parnelli Jones and old Calhoun is looking pretty obsolete at the moment. 17 seconds behind the race pace that I am setting here. I mean, just able to almost hold it flat out through three and four. And there is there a car in the wall? Looks like there may be a car in the wall. Out of turn four. That may be Jim Herdebees. It's a red car. I know Herdebees isn't a red car. Could also be Johnny Rutherford or Bill, che Bill Cheeseburg. 
Those are the three drivers in red roadsters that are not named Parnelli Jones because Parnelli, of course, is at the front. But well, we'll find out here very shortly. It's Herdebees. So Herdebees got put up in the wall in turn four. I'm going to try to drive underneath him nice and easily. And indeed, I do that. So it's amazing what a contrast between the start of the season and the end of the season. I was running back here, <laughs> not lapping people at the start of the season. I was back here on merit because my car was slow. And now with a fast car, you can just see what a difference it makes as we got Bob Winty up here. Traffic is going to be a bit of a pain. I've got to be very careful. I can't be as reckless as I was at Milwaukee in the traffic. That's what took me out of that race. But thankfully, the nice people at the Trenton Speedway put a nice big apron down here that I can use, kind of similar to Indianapolis and lapping traffic. You can kind of use the apron as a bit of a, a bit of a uh, dump off area if you need to get out of the way. Mathauser and Bud Tinglestad will drive around Mathauser at least, possibly Tinglestad. As we go through the right-hander, going to be on the outside there, and I'm not really too keen on doing that, passing a, a kind of slightly understeery roadster doing that, but you never know. All right, so Johnny Boyd right in front. Going to dive up the inside of him, hopefully pass. Yes, nice and clean. So this is a little bit nicer to lap cars here at Trenton as Jim Clark moves up into second place past Parnelli Jones. That's very interesting. Uh, nicer to lap cars here because this track surface is wider, it just lets me be able to dictate where I want to go and not kind of be dictated by the one groove racetrack that Milwaukee very much is, especially in these cars. As I'm coming up behind Jim McElreath and the Novi, the factory car, much faster than the uh, Max Wiggly uh, variety of Novi's as I drive around him, car number 28 and take off down the front straightaway once again. Looking at lap number 17. Already almost halfway through this race. So it's going pretty fast. And the first of the rear engine cars I see coming up behind. I believe that is Len Sutton in one of the Watson Fords. Or maybe that's an Offenhauser powered car. I honestly can't remember. Might be an Offenhauser car because it's so far back in the pack. Ooh, that was close. That was close. That was not what I wanted to do right there. I got schnookered in. I thought I could run low, and then Lynn Sutton kind of came down. I bailed out of it, and then the car got unstable. But I was able to hold on to it, thankfully. Got a 30-second lead on Parnelli Jones, so it's not really that big of a deal right now. Jimmy Clark hanging tough in second position, or third position now, hanging tough directly behind Parnelli Jones, I should say. Trying to dive up the inside of Sutton in the right-hander. Didn't quite work there either. Yeah, Sutton's much tougher to pass because he's got a rear-engine car. And, of course, the rear-engine cars make up their lap time in similar spots on the track. So if he's fast in the corner, I'll be fast in the corner. But I'll go underneath Troy Rutman and make contact. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Woo, that two-for-one deal at Kmart almost turned into a blue light special that I did not want to see, which meaning the blue lights of the ambulance, not the blue lights of a fantastic deal at Kmart. Woo, that would have been terrible. So I lost a few seconds to Jones there, but again, it's not a big deal, is it? My car's a bit OP. Now what will be interesting is at the beginning of the 65 season, Will my car be this dominant? Because I think, you know what, I'm not going to upgrade anything coming into the Trenton 150. I know that's always a bit of a hit or miss thing, but I would be interested to see the performance of this car versus the 65 models that will be coming in. I don't know, we'll wait and see on that one. Up into fifth gear. Diving it in to the right-hander. Lifting off the gas line, Bobby Grimm going down a gear, which is kind of unique for that part of the course, but it worked out because I got some good torque off of the corner, and we'll lap a couple more cars. I may lap the field at this rate because of just how nice and easy it is to lap the opposition. 
This is exactly what I need to do. Bobby Marshman in the second. Lotus. Teammate to Jimmy Clark. Drive around the outside of him. He actually yielded the position to me. Very sportsmanly thing to do there, Bobby. Appreciate it. And again, just able to maintain the speed through three and four. So much faster. That's such a faster way around when you can actually use the throttle effectively. And there's a big group of cars just a few seconds up the road from me. I suspect that's probably the leaders or a good portion of the leaders. So I've actually been running a fast lap of 147 miles an hour, which is two miles an hour faster than I'd run in qualifying. So I'm actually turning faster laps than in qualifying. And I should not have downshifted there, but yes, these are the leaders. Don Branson is in second. Jim Clark has fallen to, uh, to fourth place. I should say Don, Don Branson is in third place. But this is Foyt ahead of me, I believe. So we'll see how dirty Foyt decides to be. If dirty at all. Up the gear. That is a lapped car just ahead. That should be Hathaway. As the championship rivals go side by side through turn three at Trenton. But I'll drive around the outside of him and also around Hathaway. And you know what? I'm starting to think that those cars are not powered by Novi's. They may be powered by Offenhauser's because when I go by, there's not the scream that you hear from the Novi's. You may have noticed when I went by... Um, oh, God, I can't remember who drove the other one. I think it was Tinglestad. No, it wasn't Tinglestad. I don't know who... Whoever's driving the factory Novi car, the Curtis Novi, uh, I think you can hear the distinctive wail of the Novi. You can't hear that when you go by those privateer Curtis cars, so maybe I'm saying it wrong. And really, it's a privately entered Curtis with an Offenhauser engine. Jim McElreath is the driver in that car as I see it scroll across the screen. And now, got a lot of the big dogs right here trying to lap traffic. Is this going to be trouble? Oh, Branson gets held up. He dives to the outside. Jimmy Clark goes around for second or third position. Second in the group. And they are all getting held up by this lap car. Oh, my goodness. Roger Ward and Don Branson, teammates, nearly taking each other out there. The two rear engine off and or, uh, Watson Ford cars. Now drive underneath Cheeseburg. About to put an entire lap on the field. This is true domination. As I'll pass the Watsons, they gave me such trouble at Milwaukee. And I suspect Roger Ward's not gonna be particularly the most happy with me, especially after our contact at Milwaukee. Now Jimmy Clark and Parnelli Jones, what a dynamic duo these two are. So essentially this is the battle for first, second, and third, and fourth, counting Roger Ward, but of course, I'm putting an entire lap on the field halfway through the race. Unbelievable. And yes, as I go down the main straightaway, that is an entire lap on the field and only 26 laps. As we begin lap number 27. Well, if I'm gonna break the curse, this is probably the way I would draw it up. Just absolutely smash the field. Again, I'm not using any 1965 model parts. This is a 64 chassis with a 64 gearbox and a 64 engine. This car is just this OP. Very, very OP. Look at this, the gap I've already pulled on Pernelli Jones. Unbelievable. Beginning lap number 28. Should be seeing more of the back of the field once again. Because those two cars weren't necessarily that I lapped, have lapped twice now. They weren't necessarily in isolation from the rest of the field. But maybe they've gone slow enough that they are now. Don't believe I'll end up lapping the field twice. That'd be a pretty big ask, I believe, especially considering that we only got to lap them just past the halfway mark.
Just sliding the back end of the car just a little bit. Hard on the throttle out of the corner. And yeah, there are more cars going through three and four here at Trenton. And the tires are starting to wear as well. Interesting to see that the front tires are wearing much more than the rears. I guess you ask a bit more of them at Trenton Speedway for whatever reason. And beginning the 30th lap, so 20 laps to go next time by. And again, got an entire lap lead on the field. This is domination. This is what Jim Clark did, except for to the nth degree in the early season race here. Be interesting to see what Clark can do in the 65 season. Seems like Clark does uh, refuses to go to Langhorn. So if he can get a couple wins early on, including the Indianapolis 500, which he did win in real life, he could be in good shape. What killed Jim Clark was the DNF at Milwaukee. Had he finished in the points, we may be talking about a much different championship scenario right now. Instead of two cars being championship contenders, we may have had three. But regardless, we got to focus on the task at hand right now. And the task at hand is holding on to the lead and the win and the championship for 1964. We got a big run on Bob Harkey. Just look at the incredible speed advantage I have. Going down into turn one, breaking, cornering, straightaway speed. It's all there. It's as perfect as you could ask for in terms of a racing day right now for me. Yeah, it feels like I'm in 1967 when everybody else is in 1964, but it's really not that way. A dive underneath Wente, just not even, not even a contest. Bob Tinglestad, or Bud Tinglestad, no contest. Not so much as a defensive move or any attempt to hold me off. Ronnie Duman just out in front. Can I pass him? Ooh, don't push up into me, sir. Appreciate it if you stay just a car length away. Thank you very much. And we'll clear him. A couple of red roadsters just out in front of me as well. That's probably, well, one of them's Jim Herdebees. I'm not sure who the other one could be. Hard on the gas again coming out of the corner. See a little bit of tire smoke up there, but I suspect that's because of cars shifting, not necessarily because there's contact, but then again, you just never know with this game. It's not the Milwaukee 200, because that Milwaukee 200 is such a dangerous race. There's always crashing. There's always spectacular action. Oh! Oh my gosh! Speaking of... That was so close. What on earth was going on there? Jim Herdebees lost control on the main straightaway. Smacked the wall, and now we've got another crash. Big, big wreck up in front. Big, big wreck up in front. Three cars. Johnny Boyd, Jim McElreath, and Bud Tinglestad was that. Or was it Jim Malloy? I can't, I could not tell. Regardless, what is going on? So many cars crashing, and there's more problems behind. I just saw in the rearview mirror three more cars piling in. So there could be a massive pileup coming into turn three. We'll have to see. Good Lord, man. I just been talking about how nice it was to drive this, uh, this track, and now suddenly we're starting to see some of this Milwaukee style crashing despite the fact that there's four less cars out here to crash into each other Unbelievable So that's Hathaway up there in the Curtis And you can just see how much he holds up Len Sutton 
That is not fun when you're the guy who's just slower or just faster than the guy you're trying to lap and you can't quite lap him because your car's performance isn't that much better. But Sutton manages to get around Hathaway and he clears him, so good for him. 13 laps remaining. I've got to survive for 13 more. Dale! Car 88, Dale! Anyway, speaking of Dale, we're going to go underneath 77, Bob Mathauser. Car 14 is Troy Rutman. So Johnny Boyd, Bob Harkey, Troy Rutman, Jim McElreath, all involved in incidents, as well as, of course, Jim Herdebees, who crashed on his own a, la a half a lap before the big one. Coming up. To start lap 39 to complete lap 38 here. More traffic out in front. That's going to be the name of the game here, especially considering how fast I'm running. It may be a possibility to lap the whole field because I believe that may be Bill Cheeseburg just in front. And he was a part of the lead group early on. So we'll see. A two lap lead on Merritt would be pretty incredible. Foyt still running 7th, so he's still in the points. So I've still got to kind of got to go somewhat hard because there's always a possibility that Foyt could start moving up. If there's one crash that takes out, you know, the four cars ahead of Foyt, or the six cars ahead of Foyt, I guess five cars ahead of Foyt that aren't me, there's every possibility, and that's Herdebees again, so we just got past Herdebees and we're going to see him again. Um, there's every possibility that AJ could still finish second and I could lose the championship despite winning the race. Winning the battle but not the war. That's kind of how you describe that one. But right now, with 40 laps coming to complete now, which will be 10 laps to go in the race, Things are looking well in hand for me. But again, we saw in Milwaukee what can happen in the last 10 laps. And Indianapolis for that matter. I've lost two races that I should have otherwise won because of silly things happening. So this is the same kind of a situation here, though a lap cushion is certainly one that's nice to have over the field. It's just, but it is just that, a cushion, not a guarantee of victory. So I almost put the wheels in the dirt there, but just kept it out of them, or out of the dirt, I should say. And crossing the line now, starting lap number 42, nine laps to go. After this one, it'll be eight laps to go. But you can do math, I'm sure. Lloyd Ruby, who had a pretty good qualifying effort, had a, has had a few good qualifying efforts, I should say, and was pretty fast in the 50 or the 63 season. Not quite there here in 64, but you just never know. Ooh, and Ruby not particularly giving me the most room off of the corner, but now I'll drive around him as I see him shifting on the straightaway. So. He was downshifting in the in the banked corner, which I certainly was not. Of course, I needed downshift in turn one. I don't know if I'll, I'll ever not need to downshift in turn one, even once the wings come into effect in 1971. But again, that's still a long way off in Indy 500 evolution terms. Riding that white line just below it, catching the dirt just a little bit. Off of the corner, down the back straightaway. <laughs> down the back straightaway. Down the main straightaway. Underneath Bobby Grimm. And definitely throwing it into the corner quite a bit. That was definitely a way more aggressive move than it needed to be. I will say that pretty concisely. I probably didn't need to lap him that fast, but you know, when you're in a rhythm, you kind of got to stay in that rhythm. This should be Bobby Marshman up here in the second Lotus Ford. Of course, the first Lotus Ford I would describe as Jim Clark. 
And I don't think I would get too much flack for saying that. Crossing the line here. Six laps to go. Working lap number 45. Up the gear, looking for Marshman here. Can't quite get to him yet. Jimmy Clark up back up in the third place. But will he pass Parnelli for second? That is the question. To get a good run behind Marshman. Big time draft on the long front straightaway here at Trenton. Backing off the gas. Oh, whoa, 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 David, David, David. Don't do that. Do not do that. My heart leapt big time there. My heart leapt big time there. It's just that much of a mistake that can that can end your race right then and there. So I use a little bit of confidence, drive underneath Marshman there. That was just <laughs> thankfully, finally I used some discretion. Roger Ward is up into second. How how he got up there past a few cars, I will never know, but he managed to do it. Four laps to go now. And a possible championship. But I have to finish the race to get it. I have to finish these final four laps. A lap advantage over the rest of the field. I'm a so scared of what's going to happen here. And there's a big group of cars out in front. Holy smokes. It looks like the entire field is grouped up together in front of me. I do not want to have anything to do with them. Especially because my car is starting to get a bit antsy going into turn one. Up into fourth gear. Driving through the kink. And right on the white line. Out of the corner. Try not to lose it. David, please, for the love of God, don't try to lose it. Troy Rutman, who crashed earlier in this race. And I'm just going to back out behind him. No thank you. If I can pass you, Troy, I'm going to do it nice and easy. Boy, I still was worried he was going to come down into me. Ooh, boy, oh boy, oh boy. And there's big traffic out in front. Big time, big time traffic out in front. Okay, time to focus in here. One lap to go. Coming up to it anyway. For the championship. Jimmy Clark up in the second. One lap behind the race. It's the final lap. 1964 has been an incredibly interesting year. Technologically speaking, competition-wise, everything you could have asked for. And thankfully, thanks to my discovery of how good the Halibrand chassis is, it helped me immensely in my championship quest. Haven't quite gotten the Indianapolis 500 yet, but as I come out of turn number four underneath Mike Hathaway for the final time in 1964, I will see the checkered flag of victory and will take my second national championship. Takes the checkered flag. And you can see the achievement, the dog leg. Not sure what that achievement's all about. Maybe we'll check it out a bit later, but I got the victory. Got the victory over Jim Clark, Don Branson, Roger Ward, Bill Cheeseburg, Parnelli Jones, A.J. Foyt, Bobby Marshman, Bobby Grimm, Lloyd Ruby, and then Bob Mathauser with a fantastic 11th, 11th place finish. Not bad for him. Then down through the second half of the field, McElreath, Rutman, Hathaway, Harkey, Boyd, Herdebees, all those guys uh, did not have very good days. Stop. The leader makes a pit stop. So that's it. Um, we'll wait to, to see the rest of the field complete the race if they are allowed to by coming into the pits. We'll see here in a second. Jim Clark, uh, what's interesting is since they got lapped, we may see a, a shift in the, in the positions because of where they come into the pits. 
Oh, well, screw it. Jim Clark takes second. I'm just going to announce that now as Don Branson and Parnelli Jones switch positions back and forth and back and forth. Doesn't matter. We've got the championship. Car number 68 makes a pit stop. Oh, and just as I say that, the official results come in. It's Clark, Jones, Branson, Ward, Cheeseburg. Stop. And you can see the rest of the field right there. So that's the 1964 season of Indy 500 Evolution. What a dramatic finish uh, to the season. I got the championship, but of course, A.J. Foyt took the big prize, the Indianapolis 500. I won the championship by five points over A.J. You can see the winners of the season. Clark took Trenton. A.J. took Indy, his second win in a row, by the way. He won in 63 as well. Milwaukee, Langhorn both went to me. Branson took the second Milwaukee race, and then I finally broke that Trenton curse. I guess that's what that achievement was for, uh, man managing to break the Trenton curse. You can see how many cars scored points in this season, definitely saying that it was a very competitive season. 18 cars uh, scored points, and if you consider only the top eight finishers in each race, uh, score points uh, and then seeing there's only six races that's a pretty competitive field all things considered you can take a look down through the rest of the field at everybody uh, that could, be, could have potentially taken part in the season Max Wigley there in 48th uh, point the absolute legend uh, with zero points and then all the way down uh, 51 drivers theoretically could have taken part in the uh, in a race this year though I don't think every single one of them even attempted to qualify for a race but yeah, that was the 1964 season of Indy 500 Evolution. Thank you guys so much for watching and supporting this series. It means a whole lot to me. I really enjoy playing it. I really enjoy sharing it with you. And I enjoy uh, kind of being the only guy who is positive about this game on YouTube because every other video pretty much is a guy trashing this game. There's no reason to trash this game. It's freaking awesome. I only wish that this game had come out, you know, a couple years later right as the YouTube gaming craze was happening, I think it would have been much more successful. And hey, maybe we would have gotten a sequel. Uh, how cool would it have been if we'd gotten the 80s or the 70s uh, Indy 500 Evolution? But anyway, that's uh, Water Under the Bridge. Uh, and again, I thank you guys so much for watching. Subscribe if you want some more Indy 500 Evolution and for more Indy 500 month content. We will see you in the 1965 season of Indy 500 Evolution.